Hello and welcome to another preview show here at Vitality Stadium. Matchday commentator Chris Temple joins me and we'll be looking ahead to another big week in the Premier League. Let's take a look at what's coming up. We'll be looking back at last weekend's defeat to Fulham here at Vitality Stadium. We'll also be reviewing the Minus 17 documentary that came out earlier this week. And finally, we'll turn our attention to the game at St Mary's tomorrow afternoon. But first, we're going to start back at last weekend's game here at Vitality Stadium. A 1-0 defeat to Fulham, Chris. After the highs of Brighton, it's mm. uh, back back down to, to another yeah. defeat. Yeah, it's, it's, I guess it summed up the second half of the season, really, didn't it? In the, the inconsistency. Um, I'm... Uh, the mitigating circumstances last week, I think if you, you lose Adam Smith 15 minutes before kickoff and then Junior Stanislas, you know, comes in and a terrible bit of luck. And, you know, the update today is that he's going to be out for four months, which is just a, another terrible blow for him. But I mean, that's 20 minutes into the game. So even, you know, the fullback situation now is that the emergency fullbacks are getting injured. So it's just, you know, I mean, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, I spoke to Chris Meppham ahead of the game at Southampton tomorrow, and he said he didn't think he's played in as many positions in the whole of a season as he did in the game last week. Um, he was at right wing back at one point, right centre half, right back. Um, and just, yeah, it was it was a real sort of putting pieces of the jigsaw together and, and you know, not quite getting the full picture. So, um, you know, the stats are that Fulham hadn't won away and were, were woeful and were relegated. But actually, we saw a team from them showing a bit of fight for their new manager, um, showing that he's got a few building blocks for next season. Uh, I think the, the key moments in the game, as well as the injuries, I mean, Joshua King missed a, a glaring chance early on if that goes in you know once again it's the whole if that goes in it's a different afternoon situation um so i think that's the key the key thing is that the, the chances weren't taken um and in the end it, huffing and puffing it, it, you didn't really feel like there was an equalizer coming really to be honest with you and as you say you know first 10 20 minutes started very well created chances and then that injury things completely changed didn't they yeah it just knocked everything out of kilter didn't it i mean you ended up with nathan Ake and steve cook the, the senior center half pairing playing in the fullback positions um and yes the attacking people will say well the attacking players were the same you know it's you know Fraser Brooks Wilson King they're the you know Lerma and Gosling in the center so the sort of the attacking six if you like are the same but the, the platform often comes from the back and the balance of the team and the the, the fullbacks are obviously such a big part of the way Bournemouth play in terms of the attacking game as well so um, yeah I, I just it just knocked everything out of kilter didn't it? there was no fluidity there was there, it was disjointed um, but I think you know Ultimately, missing the chances is a thing that will be, you know, county against Bournemouth because that's the bit that you can control. Um, sometimes, you know, that the, the situation does turn against you in the injury front, and I think um, it was probably destined not to be their day from the moment Adam Smith pulled out in the warm-up. Absolutely, and as you say, at one point we had four centre backs all playing along the back four. Yeah, I mean, what, what can you do? I mean, uh, yes, the Cherries have mobile centre backs. You know, they're not the old-fashioned sort of with the greatest respect to Willow. You know, they, it was not like having four Willows along the back, um, but you know still even when you've got Steve Cook playing at right back who's probably not fit enough to be playing right back and he took a knock in the first half as well um, so they had to move him back to centre back so yeah just all in all Eddie was, must have been Eddie and Jason on the bench must have been just looking around going you know what have we got to do to keep some keep some full backs fit here so um, you know the news for this week is that Adam Smith is going to be um, is going to be out again Nathaniel Klein is going to be a late decision so again that we'll talk about it later but that could impact how Eddie has to set up at Saints tomorrow. Absolutely and, and with that result for them's first away win of the season Bournemouth will be going into the weekend you know, really fired up, won't they? Hoping to put things right. Have to be. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's not a bad game to be going into, really, to try and sort of get things going. I mean, let's cast their mind back a couple of weeks to Brighton. Um, the, two, the team sort of unrecognisable. That day, everything went right. Last weekend, pretty much everything went wrong. Um, so it's a Brighton performance away from home. I, I just wonder whether the, you know, the, the freedom of playing away in this fixture um, could help Bournemouth, really. Just, you know, the chance to have a go with safety secured now, of course, been mathematically secured this week, as well as being all but safe the week before. Um, and now, you know, hopefully Southampton, they're, they're pretty much there as well. Not quite mathematically, but I think everybody would assume they are now safe. Um, so hopefully it'll be a bit more of an open, entertaining game than a couple of the KG affairs we've seen, certainly here earlier in the season, which was a bit of a, a bit of a nil-nil stinker. Absolutely. Well, we'll come on to Southampton a little bit later on. Now then, earlier in the week, AFC BTV launched the Minus 17 documentary, and we had a premiere at the Odeon down in Bournemouth. Here's a little look at what ex-players, fans and local journalists thought of the documentary. Well, we've just finished watching the Minor 17 documentary here at the Odeon. What were your thoughts on it? Oh, I thought it's, it's fantastic. All, all the memories come flooding back and what was a truly memorable season for, for the club, but personally for myself, one of my highs in football. So, um, yeah, fantastic evening. Great to see all, all the teammates. We're all great friends and, uh, you know, 
things like that, you build a bomb forever and you can see the lads together now. It's, um, you know, the camaraderie and the, the team spirit still lives with us. And um, yeah, it's um, a, a great evening, a lovely evening. That was a huge emotional roller coaster. Um, what have happened over the last 10 years has just been incredible. Um, to see the, the lows that the club has gone through to the ultimate highs is a, is a real test of character and strength of everyone that's uh, been involved in the club. I thought it was very descriptive, very good, brought back some real emotions of what actually happening. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was incredible from start to finish, the, the detail, the interviews, there's, there's highs, there's lows. It really hits the real emotion of what was going on in the club at the time. And I think you see bits of the story that perhaps a lot of people didn't know about at the time. And I think that's going to open a lot of people's eyes and take them back 10 years when the club is in a very different place to where it is now. I thought it was brilliant. I just, I remember it like it was yesterday though. So it's just something that seemed to happen yesterday and it just floods back all the memories and what, what a season and just remember all the sort of trips on the road as well in particular more even perhaps more than some of the home games and just the whole view of just being going up to some of far distance away games and just thinking actually we're not going to do this and then now we actually did and it was incredible and it was just good to see it all brought back together really. I thought it was really good um, a really good accurate account of what happened and it brought back a lot of memories a lot of emotions the the mood was set I think from the beginning of the film as I said it was very uh, very true reflection of what happened and how we were all feeling at the time and as you say even though you knew Fletch popped up with that goal it was it was still an enthralling end. Just to see that moment of elation in particularly when Fletch scored in the Grimsby game just brought back years of memories and, and it's just been brilliant I mean and, and that was such so well done and the humour that came out particularly Mark Molesley <laughs> I thought was um, superb it was really good to see um, you know some of the clips back from from, from 10 years ago um, to bring back their memories, it was, uh, yeah, as I said, it was really surreal. I didn't really expect um, it to be so, uh, so special, um, to, to walk in to a full cinema and with the fans and, and, and share this moment with the fans, it was really great to see. It was, it was great the way it was, it was all pieced together and it was a special um, to see everything uh, back 10 years ago. Chris, it was a, a brilliant night down at the Odeon, wasn't it? Yeah, really good. Um, first and foremost, you know, Kudos to the guys behind the documentary, you know, James Hart, Matt Joyce, Chris Payne with the graphics and everything. And I know all of you guys played a part in some in some regard. So, and the team that pulled the uh, event together at uh, the Odeon as well. It was a brilliant night. Um, the feedback for everything has been so has been so great to read. You know, from um, ex players to the supporters that turned up on the night, from season ticket holders from ten years ago. So, and it was great to see. You know, the camaraderie among and the team spirit among that 08-09 team. You could see it even at that event the other night. It was the, the banter was flowing. It, you could see it was they were enjoying each other's company and you know I think everybody was you know really pleased with how the story was told and you know high praise from from Eddie Howe himself who said it was a, a really accurate portrayal and um, you know brought back a lot of emotions for him as well. And to have the premiere at the Odeon it was a, a proper event all the ex-players there as you say enjoying themselves as if it was 10 years ago. Yeah exactly and I think rightly so because yeah, and again it just brings back a bit of the history of, of what the club has been through um, you know you, you'll always get the fans who'll say you know forget what's gone in the past this is the here and now let's deal with it let's go forward let's get better let's get bigger um, but of course you know that those moments are a massive part of the history because the club might not be here so it's uh, it's, it's foolish really to, to look past them and, and don't forget the generations of new support from around the world not just you know fan, new, younger fans maybe who have struggled to get into games here but now Bournemouth are their team because you know in the Premier League limelight but the profile that Bournemouth has around the world now as well there'll be lots of people tuning in around the world who had absolutely no idea that it came that close to, to all going pear shape so um, yeah I think that there'll be great viewing numbers for, for the documentary and, and great feedback for, has been received already. Absolutely and you say about the positive feedback and especially about the younger fans you know it's a, a real story for them to to learn about their club and really appreciate you know that we're here today after after all of that yeah and they see a lot of Steve Fletcher you know at, at photo calls and things they now can realize actually what he what he did back there which is do something uh, do something pretty amazing um, and what a big part of the you know and also seeing the photos of Eddie Howe as a young manager as well because they only see him in the the here and now and he's you know he's a calm head on his shoulders and they think he's been around for years and years well he has for now but you know back then when he was 31 and fresh faced and wearing some dodgy old gear as well on the training ground, some you know, huge shell suit bottoms and things back then. Um, but it, it was interesting to speak to Eddie, actually, it's sort of out of the current day context because, and to ask him, you know, what 
methods and things that he, he sort of learned on the hoof back then at 09 when you don't know what you're doing necessarily um, he still uses today and he says he, you know he st- whatever came naturally to them to him then as a manager is still a big part of what he does today of course he tweaks it and learns as he goes along but yeah 10 years ago he might have he might have better hair now but uh, the methods are still the same and it was it was very important to recognise, you know, the unsung heroes of that season. We saw the likes of Steve Hard in the documentary, people like Joe Roach as well, who are both still here today. Yeah, who knew Steve Hard had such good banter, by the way? Because he's uh, he, <laughs> around the training ground. He's, he's a very dry wit, Steve Hard, uh, the physio. But again, yeah, you know, as we heard of the documentary, him stopping the bailiffs, putting padlocks on the, the club shop and things. Uh, and a lot of the staff, you know, it's a credit to the, the people here that a lot of the staff were here in the tough times. You know, you think of Rob Mitchell, the commercial director, and, and Liz Finney, the general manager, and obviously Jeff Mostyn, and lots of people behind the the scenes in the jobs in the ticket office and things like that the club shop um, who were all there at the time um, and are still part of it now and it was really nice to recognize them and and give them their moment as well coming in with the players when they all got sort of welcomed into the cinema and of course looking at that team from the 0809 season you see you see the likes of you know Steve Fletcher who's still here today Mark Molesley Sean Cooper in the under 21 setup Alan Connell in the under 18 setup it's incredible to think 10 years on that they're still such a big part of the club yeah and you know it was nice as well as well as all those guys who are here and we do see every week and we do talk to them I guess it's nice for them to be put into the back into the context of being players here. Um, you know, great to catch up with some of those who we don't see so often. You know, the likes of Liam Feeney, who's obviously up north these days, and uh, Danny Hollands, who's you know down the road at Eastley and has got now got connections with Portsmouth. He's doing a bit of coaching down there as well. The, the only one shame was that Brett Pittman was tied to a, a sponsor's evening at Portsmouth as captain and couldn't be here because he was obviously a, a huge part with his goals. And one of the really nice moments on the night was was his goal at Exeter getting applauded in the room and uh, that mazy run from one end of the field to the other. So um, yeah, um, that was. You know, I'm sure he was uh, he was disappointed not to be here, but a huge part of the of the season. Well, you mentioned a couple of names there. Darren Anderton was one that was mm. there, and of course he he'd come over from America. Yeah, Darren Anderton again, who you know was a big part of the first half of the season, and in terms of the character, I mean, you think of characters like Big Fletch and the impact they have on the dressing room. You know, for the younger players in that team, um, going through a difficult time, um, someone like Darren Anderton with his experience would have been absolutely huge. Um, so yes, he may have you know retired at, uh, in the first half of the season and didn't play a role in the actual escaping, but in terms of what he would have done to, to lift things when it wasn't going so well in the first half of the season you know and to hear him again speak so fondly of his time at Bournemouth was it was really nice to hear as well. Absolutely well if you haven't seen the Minor 17 documentary it is available for free on AFCB TV right now so make sure you go and check it out. Now then our attention turns to tomorrow's game at St Mary's and Eddie Houseman speaking in his pre-match press conference earlier this morning. Yeah it was a very special evening on uh, on Wednesday really really enjoyed it the chance as you see to see ex-teammates, a lot of players that I managed for the first time in a long, long, long time. The first step to that is Southampton. We have to look at this game. We know the huge importance it has to our supporters um, and for everyone connected with the club. So we need to make sure we turn up and give a very good account of ourselves. Uh, They've been in great form, Southampton. Um, They've done very well since the new manager's gone in there and he's changed quite a few things. You know, he's changed the way they play and uh, their mentality to the game. So we're going to need to be at our very best. Yeah, I think it's, it's set up perfectly. It'll be a, a really entertaining game. I'm sure the atmosphere will be very good. Um, that's one of the things I remember from the last year's game. I think our supporters travelled really well and were, were, were great. Um, Southampton fans really got behind their team. We need to make sure that we impose ourselves in the game and uh, we show our best selves. Yeah, um, the long-term injuries are still the same. We can now add to that list Junior, who went under the knife yesterday on operation on his, his hamstring. Um, so... He will be out, I think, for around three to four months. I'd probably need to clarify that to give you a definite answer, but I think it's around that period of time. So a big blow for him, a big blow for us. It's been a a tough season for Junior. Well, that was Eddie Howe speaking in this morning's pre-match press conference. Chris, it's a a different game tomorrow, one that means a bit more. It does, uh, to supporters, yeah. Um, Again, Eddie Howe is one of those... Don't get too high when you win. Don't get too low when you lose. Every game's the same. You know, he, he does keep it on a level sort of playing field, if you like, throughout the season. Um, but of course, there's a bit extra to this one. There, there always is. There haven't been classics, these games. They really haven't been that good, um, which is a shame because, you know, you'd, you'd love to have a, a sort of a, you know, a 3-2 barnstormer um, with a, a raucous atmosphere and some brilliant goals. But the nil-nil here early in the season was really poor. Uh, and actually, it was one of the sort of first poor games of the season because obviously Bournemouth had started the season on fire. Southampton had started really poorly. Um, I think Bournemouth had 16 points and Southampton 
Southampton had four um, when the two teams met earlier in the season. It was sixth against 16th then. Here we are now, four points separating the two teams. Southampton have obviously been resurgent since Ralph Hasenhutl has come in. Uh, they seem to have found their, their formation. They seem to have found the way they want to play now all of a sudden. It's still not the finished article because obviously he needs a summer transfer window as well to, to get his, his squad the way he wants it. But dealing with basically Mark Hughes' squad, um, they, they've turned the corner and, and particularly at home they seem to be pretty strong now they've had some good results um, been a bit unfortunate in a couple of games you know at Watford in midweek they got pegged back right in the last minute after scoring after 7.69 seconds as you do um, so yeah they're, they're again a bit like uh, Fulham we said last week who'd sort of turned a bit of a corner just as they come to play Bournemouth Southampton have as well um, the intrigue, of course, is still the opportunity to finish as the top South Coast club, even though Bournemouth have been sliding down the table and midweek results have left them in 14th position now, which is, uh, you know, all of a sudden from being 10th, 11th, 12th to being 14th, you're only a couple of places above the, the bottom three all of a sudden. So um, the highest Bournemouth can realistically finish now is 11th, um, which will have their eye on. 47 points, two wins from three, record points total still possible. But in terms of the local game, first win at St Mary's, as you mentioned earlier on, um, first win at Southampton ever, even at the Dell days, would be lovely. And as you said, Southampton, they have picked up a bit, obviously, in the week, conceding so late on, but they've also got that win against Wolves, which was a fantastic result at the time. Yeah, they, and they, they, they needed those results because they were bang in trouble. Let's not forget, you know, they were, they were struggling. Um, one stat that tells you what an impact Hasenhutl has had is that um, Pellegrino and Mark Hughes, the two previous managers, won eight games out of 52 between them. Hasenhutl has won eight out of 20. So that just tells you in one stat what, a, what an impact he's had. He was a gamble. You know, he came in unheard of, really, in, in, in British circles um, from his time at, at Leipzig. Um, so, you know, he... he any time you bring a manager into the English Premier League, there's no guarantee, as we've seen with quite a few of the Saints managers down the years. They don't necessarily uh, settle. You think of Claude Puel, who, albeit he finished eighth and got to a League Cup final, but you know he didn't didn't really fit at Southampton. Um, even Ronald Koeman, you know, didn't really necessarily have it his own way before he left for Everton as well. So yeah, it's been a, a few years of change there. This is the fifth manager that Eddie Howe will have come up against in his eight Premier League games against Southampton: Puel, Koeman, Pellegrino, Hughes, and now Hasenhutl. So it's every time Eddie Howe comes up against. Southampton he's coming up against a different sort of setup if you like um, but they do work hard that's the one thing they'll they'll find Bournemouth this week is that Southampton are a hard working team uh, Nathan Redmond has been resurgent banging a few goals in James Ward-Prowse has been chipping in with a few goals although he was playing at right wing back in in midweek and possibly some would say should have been suspended for that game after a, a bit of a body check last weekend um, but yeah they've they've got some attacking threats Shane Long's found his goal scoring boots again so yeah they've got a few threats all of a sudden absolutely and obviously three games left of the season now it's it's important to finish strongly isn't it and and you know have a bit of a momentum ahead of the start of next season yeah I think and Bournemouth fans would love to finish above Southampton again for the second season or again it's just a nice to have I described it to Eddie this morning in our in our chat it's a nice to have you know no one at the start of the season go right the, the season targets are finished above Southampton there'll be one or two people who've got Southampton friends and family members who they sit next to in the office or they want to have banter with who'll say that is the top priority of the season is finished above Southampton but all in all it's not really um, of course um, but yeah the, the record points total it is still a nice one to have I just think as we've said before finishing sort of 14th 15th 16th it's not after the first half of the season it's not where you want to be finishing so um, I, th making a late bid to try and finish 11th or 12th um, and finish strongly uh, is of course what everybody wants because everyone hates being on a downer over the summer and the, the f first half of the season deserves more but with injuries and other things that have gone wrong and the tough fixture list and obviously a loss of confidence, um, now is the time for the, the tail to wag a little bit, if you like, to use a, a cricketing terminology um, and to, to try and pick up those elusive six points in these last couple of, last three games. And every week we stand here, we talk about our team news and we mentioned it a bit earlier, no Adam Smith and of course no Junior Sanislas. Every week I joke you're going to get a game and this could be the closest you'll get this weekend if you I can play you right back. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean... Looking at it now, if Nathaniel Klein doesn't make it, they'll have to go three at the back. Unless that, I mean, you don't want to play Ryan Fraser at right back, um, really, away from home when, you, when you're trying to find a creative spark and the way they played at Brighton when Fraser was, was on fire. So I can only see three at the back if, if um, Klein isn't fit. And it, it is genuinely touch and go, I think, if he will be against his old club, of course. I'm sure Nathaniel Klein would, would like to play at Southampton, where, where he played before. Um, Arta Boric is uh, expecting a new arrival in his family. I think it's due today. So uh, I don't know how, it, if that happened, whether that would affect the goalkeeping situation at all. I'm sure he would like to play at Southampton as well, another of his old clubs as well. Um, but yeah, you're looking at the back three. You know, you can see a back three of Ake, Cook and, and Mepham. Uh, and then you're trying to sort of fill the wing back positions um, with sort of Fraser on one side. I mean, Jordan Ibe has disappeared out of the... Um, out of the sort of 
off the bench last weekend. We don't understand that he's injured. Um, he has played right wing back before. Again, it's not a position you want to be playing David Brooks in, I don't think, really. You'd like to see him more centrally. So needs needs may well must that they need to change the, the formation. Um, Joshua King's goal scoring stats make interesting reading, by the way. I think it's about time he popped up with an away goal. He scored at St Mary's last season. Um, he's had six and seven at home. He hasn't scored an 11 away. So it would be another good day to repeat his goal scoring feats at St Mary's last year. Absolutely. Well, a very interesting game tomorrow indeed. If you are going to St Mary's, then we hope you have a safe journey there. But if not, make sure you listen to Chris on live commentary and keep up to date with all the updates on our social media and our website. Thanks for joining us.